Welcome to part four of LBJ, the Great Society in Vietnam. Now we're going to talk about the origins of the Vietnam War. So a little background on Vietnam. What is today Vietnam was part of, from 1880 until World War II, French Indochina. French Indochina was uh, modern day Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Now, Vietnam was under the nominal control of an emperor named Bao Dai, which literally means keeper of greatness. Uh, Bao Dai's real name was uh, Win Vien Thu. Um, in 1940, the Japanese occupied French Indochina uh, and kept Bao Dai as a powerless figurehead. So in May of 1941, nationalists established a League for the Independence of Vietnam. They called themselves the Viet Minh. Okay. Uh, they were under the command of a very uh, charismatic leader named Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh, though, also was the leader of a front called the, uh, a front organization called the Indochinese Communist Party. He was a communist. Okay. Now, during World War II, the Viet Minh were very useful to the United States. They rescued downed U.S. pilots. They located Japanese prisoner war camps. Uh, they helped U.S. prisoners escape, and they provided valuable information to the Office of Strategic Services, right? The OSS. As a matter of fact, Ho Chi Minh was a special OSS agent. Right. But when Japanese, the Japanese surrendered on December, September 2nd, 1945, France decided to re exert its influence or its rule over French Indochina. Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh had no interest in becoming just another colonial possession again. So they rose up in resistance. Ho Chi Minh had written eight letters to Harry S. Truman, imploring him to recognize an independent, independent Vietnam. All these letters were uh, ignored. So the Viet Minh began an insurgency, a guerrilla uh, fight against French colonial rule. In May of 1954, the Viet Minh, under the command of a general named Vo Nguyen Giap, is going to mount a massive assault on a French garrison in the northwestern part of uh, Vietnam called Dien Bien Phu. This victory of the Viet Minh is going to happen in at the same time as a series of conferences were beginning in uh, Geneva, the French at this point really want out of Vietnam. Beginning on April 26, 1954, you're going to have a series of negotiations in Geneva called the Geneva Conference, right? Out of this is going to come the Geneva Accords. The negotiations went in earnest um, beginning May 8th after the uh, fall of Dien Bien Phu, right? Intended, attending this a particular set of, uh, of negotiations was delegates from France, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, China, the United States, and also representatives of the Viet Minh, the La Laos, and Cambodia. What was determined in this uh, Geneva Accords was uh, a series of the breaking up of French Indochina. You're going to have an independent Laos and an independent Cambodia, both set with provisions to have uh, free elections beginning in 1955 and with the help of French troops, should they request it. But Vietnam was going to be a little bit more difficult to deal with. And the reason why was the power in Vietnam was Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. In other words, a communist regime. Well, couldn't really do that, at least from the American or the Western side of things. So the decision was made to split Vietnam in half, basically invent a country. They're going to split Vietnam along the 17th parallel. And the order will go out, say you have a 300-day time span, which all Viet Minh, all communists, need to go into northern Vietnam, get out of Laos, Cambodia, South Vietnam, go up there. The French will withdraw on the other side of this, um, this, this demarcation line, and then we'll set the stage for a reunification election. In July of 1956, there'll be an election in North and South Vietnam for reunification. Winner takes all. You have one Vietnam again. Now, most a lot of Viet Minh actually lived in the South, right? You know, this is their home. Uh, but, you know, the way they see it, it's like, well, in, by 1956, we're going to have a reunification election. Uh, Ho Chi Minh's ob obviously going to win. We're going to have unified uh, Vietnam again. So we're just going to go home and just wait it out. So you can have a lot of members of Viet Minh actually go to their homes in southern Vietnam with the expectation that they're going to wait it out. Uh, unfortunately, what they don't realize is that 
uh, the power base that's going to be created in the South is going to make un unification, or at least peaceable unification, impossible. The leader the United States handpicked to run the South here as they were getting established was a guy named Godin Jim. Jim was selected uh, because he was a staunch anti-communist. He hated communism. Uh, he was Catholic in a region that was predominantly Buddhist, but Catholic is at least a Christian religion. And so these kind of things made him attractive to the US. However, he was also incredibly corrupt. And once he had power, he and his family, for that matter, um, he had no intention of giving it back up, right? He's going to hold on to it tightly. And so this idea of a 1956 reunification election to him was absurd because he knew what the outcome was going to be. Just like the Viet Minh had, who had moved back into the South because they were just waiting it out, he knew that a 1956 election would result in Ho Chi Minh winning the election and he would be out of power. So he decided to do something else. He decided in October of 1955 that South Korea is going to hold their own elections and that there will be no reunification. So he'll hold a democratic, I'm going to put quotes around that, democratic election in October of 1955 in which he won. He won with 98.2% of the vote. Now, here's just a little lesson for you out there. Um, if you see something like with Lyndon Johnson's 1964 election, 61% of the popular vote, that's a landslide. If you see 98.2% of the vote, that's fraud. People typically don't win by that much. And this is clearly, clearly an, a, a case of fraud. For example, in Saigon, 150,000 more people voted than the number of people registered to vote in the city. Basically, more people voted than the population. Uh, you know, maybe they're having a Harley Davidson conference that weekend. I don't know. Jim is going to declare South Vietnam permanent. He's going to name Saigon as its capital, and he's going to name uni uh, he's going to declare reunification uh, null and void. Right. So for the Viet Minh that were sitting there in the South waiting it out, waiting it out, all of a sudden the rug's been pulled out from under them. They're like, oh wow, now there's not going to be a unified Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh, and some of them will decide, well, we better do something about this. With Jim establishing a permanent South Vietnam, he's now going to also begin building a force to defend it. With the help of the United States in 1955, he is going to form the ARVN, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And it's going to be uh, supported by U.S. Uh, dollars, U.S. equipment, and Eisenhower is going to send a small group of advisors for training purposes. Right. Jim is also, though, going to begin using these troops to take land away from the peasants and return them to the former land loan owners. He's going to re reverse some of the land redistrib redistribution policies that were implemented by the Viet Minh. He's going to forcibly uh, move many villagers from their ancestral lands to controlled settlements where he can help prevent communist activities. Right. And he's going to draft their sons into the Arvin. Right. Uh, by 1960, opposition to Jim's rule in the rural areas are going to, is going to lead to the formation of a uh, resistance group called the National Liberation Front, or the NLF. Now, the NLF is a classic communist front organization, right? And though, although communist uh, dominates the NLF, NLF leadership, the organization also embraced a lot of non-communists who opposed Jim and South Vietnamese rule, right? Uh, but the majority of those who joined the NLF were those Viet Minh, those ones that had gotten stranded in the South because of Jim's refusal of that reunification, right? So these members would begin referring themselves as Viet Cong, right? Viet Cong literally is just a way of saying Vietnamese communist, right? The aim of the NLF was to overthrow the Jim government and reunify Vietnam. Towards that end, the NLF begins training a guerrilla force, Right. In 1961, that force will be organized into the People's Liberation Armed Forces or the PLAF. I know there's a lot of acronyms being thrown out here. Right. But we now have the uh, uh, all the workings in place for an insurgency in South Vietnam. Right. In January of 1963, an Arvin force of about 2000 encountered a group of 350 PLAF at a place called Ap Bac. It's a village uh, south of Saigon on the Mekong River Delta. Right. Now, the Arvin troops were equipped with jet fighters, helicopters, armored personnel carriers, while the PLAF only had small arms. 
But despite that, the PLF will kill 61 Arvin soldiers and, um, and also three U.S. military advisors, right? Five American helicopters will also be shot down. The PLF, on the other hand, will only lose 12 men. But the key point is simply this. You notice that these advisors now are on the front lines. These advisors by 1963 have grown enough in numbers that they're really no longer advising. They're participating. So what we have here is the beginning of an escalation.